I say training wheels because that sounds bad, but it kind of is, right? I mean, uh, that, so that, please don't hear that as the meaning. Um, but the, I mean, I'm trying to help guide you to do the project. If you can do this with whatever the little thing is that you do in seven weeks, you can do that with the next thing that you want to go on and do with in life. So we can read that book. <coughs> yeah, we can read that book. All materials that I have said. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Anything else? Other questions, comments, snide remarks? Yes. The book presentation doesn't matter what book. Okay. So if you look, if there's a list of books. Yes. No, yes. So whoever signs up for which book first, you get that book. And it's online. No. We have to. We have to. What page is the list of books on? Um, Did I put it at the very end? At the very end. Oh, that's what I was Didn't read that far? Oh, I know. Well, I did. I thought that was sources. No, these are the books that you choose from. I thought they were your sources. Okay. You sign up with me. Can I just tell you right now? Or I well, I'm going to do it after. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? <laughs> Good. Uh, Everything's out of your system. Okay. <laughs> Let's go on and move ahead. Okay, so this is week one in organizational behavior. So here's where we start. Michael, can you read that? Trying to understand the behavior of some people is like trying to smell the color not. I know it's perfect. <laughs> and? What's color not? You can't understand it. It's difficult. Why? It exists. Yeah, I mean, isn't that absurd? You know what, Michael, this is a nine. The color looks like this. <laughs> the color. Right. How do you smell the color nine? Yeah, it's, right. And that's how some people behave sometimes. It's just absurd. It's, it's elusive. Okay, so let's try a little role play. Uh, I need two people, and one person is going to motivate another one to do well in class so that you can become a better manager at work. Before I call on somebody, who wants to volunteer? I'll do it. You'll do it? I'll do it. Okay, so who wants to be the motivator and who wants to be the motivatee? I'm not motivated tonight, so you can. I need some motivation. So I'm motivating you to do well in class so you can be a better manager at work. Absolutely. Okay, come on. You can come up. You can just kind of stand here and talk to me. You're very you perfect. You can do that. This is a perfect role. Yeah, yeah that actually you can do this kind of fish. Start smiling. <laughs> okay. So. Are you going to say something or is that very discouraged? He's just discouraged. <laughs> Why don't you want to be here? Don't you want to be a good manager at work? I'm just this Monday. This is late. Then think of all the good things you're going to learn, and I can help you if you need it. I just, uh, people try that way before, and it just doesn't work. I okay. mean, I've, I've really seen help. Have they provided you with all the resources you need? I guess. I mean, you got people just kind of come to you and they send you out know, certain avenues, but it never really works out. I don't know. I just tried, but I'm just lack motivation. Well, I'm in your team, and I will definitely be able to help you, and I'll give you my availability, and we can work together. We'll do this together. So you can be a better manager at work. <laughs> <laughs> One, the majority of the problems that you'll have in organizations are with people. It's not going to be with your spreadsheets. Your spreadsheets might be frustrating, but they're eminently logical. Right? Is this a fair statement? Anybody want to argue with this statement? Absolutely. Premise two, people are less than rational. We already talked about that to some degree. Now let's talk about just how they're less than rational. We're irrational or less than irrational. We eat more food when it's placed on a big plate 
than when it's placed on a small plate. You know that's true. Statistically, that's true. I don't want to go to Golden Corral and eat all I can eat for 10 bucks. I want to be able to eat half of what I can eat for 5 bucks. Right? I want to have a system like that because that would work out nicely. Right? But if that big plate is there, what do you do? You fill it, just like you would fill that one. Shopping. The guy that invented the shopping cart made a fortune. Why? Because people load it up, right? If you're going to the store, to Walmart, to pick up just a few things, don't get a cart, right? Because you will fill it. Get just your few things. Unless you've got a cart that somebody left at the aisle, like, oh, the shoes. Besides, the ones at Walmart will not push, okay? <laughs> Come on, right? Okay? We spend more when we use plastic than when we use cash. Did you know that? Statistically, it's like 20 or 30% more, depending on the study. Isn't that crazy? How do you like that? We statistically spend more when we see a MasterCard symbol in plain sight. Isn't that crazy? So if there's just a big MasterCard symbol on the wallet, you're spending more. Does that sound rational to anyone? I don't like the name Nancy still because there was a mean girl down the street that was mean when I was a little kid. Named Nancy. Isn't that crazy? That's not normal. That's not rational. But that's how we are. Have you ever looked at someone and they reminded you of someone you didn't like and you didn't like them? And you don't know them. Yeah. You don't even know that person. You're like, oh, holy crap. Yeah. Right? It's not rational. When we praise children, we hamper their success when we use, you're so smart, instead of, you work really hard. Mm -hmm. you know why? Because now they're starting to think, oh, I'm so smart. And when they run into a problem, they think, but I'm so smart. Oh, I guess I'm not that smart. As opposed to, no, I'm going to work hard. And I'm going to break. Isn't that interesting? What's the name of this book? I'll give you a hint. Don't think of an elephant. What are you thinking about right now? An elephant. Oh. An elephant. You can't not think of an elephant when I say don't think of an elephant. Reacting to authority. How do people react when they see a batch? Yes, sir. Now, in some places, they, they're trained to yell 5-0 or something along those lines, right? But they still have this reaction to authority one way or another right away. Most people defer, unless they have a really bad experience to the authority, whether it's an inner city or third world country or something along those lines. Unless they have that, they're deferential, right? We've been trained into deferentialness, okay? Receiving gifts. When Easter Seal sends you some gaudy um, uh, stickers like this, are you more or less likely to give the Easter seals? Statistically, 20 to 30 percent. Yeah? Significantly more likely when a little gift is given. What, remember the Hare Krishnas back in the 60s and 70s? The Hare Krishnas, they give you a flower, and then they'd ask for a donation, and you kind of feel like, I don't really like this guy, but I've got to give him something. Same thing, I was at Sam's Club over the weekend, and what did they have? Giving you a little something. Samples. Little samples. Now I am well aware of this, so I can take the sample with impunity. Thank you for trying yep. to sell me. <laughs> right? But what are they trying to get you to do? Right? And, and people fake it, right? They're like, hmm, yeah, I think uh, maybe, maybe I'll get that. Right? Anchoring. This is an interesting one. Why do we why do we have a MSRP manufacturer suggested retail price? At eighty dollars, but your price is sixty-five. Do we need to tell them this extraneous information? No. We sure do. Sure. You know why? I'm getting a deal, <laughs> right? We think we're getting a deal. Why? Well, it's 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 yeah, and they can suggest any price that they want. That's silly, but we fall for it. Mm. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> this works with people too, right? If you're a single person and you're looking for to make yourself look more attractive, bring an ugly person of the same gender with you. Where you go, where you know, you go to a party, you show up with somebody that's uglier and shorter than you, guys. <coughs> right? That's what you do. Ladies, I'm not sure the ugly part is still there, but I'm not sure about the shorter or taller. But I know with guys, the, the height thing plays in too. Right? Okay? <laughs> okay. You overvalue your effort. I work so hard on that paper, I should get an A plus, but your professor thinks what? Right? What's the difference? You worked on it. 
You mixed your labor with it and your blood, sweat, and tears. Oh, you know, you should be rewarded for my effort. No, you should not be rewarded for your effort. You should be rewarded if it's right. Okay? But, so you overvalue your effort. Others see more accurately. It's true that statistically it's been shown that others see more accurately. Okay? We identify with winners and distance ourselves from losers. Right? The Daily News is really good with this kind of thing, right? <coughs> we won! Okay? They lost. Them bad folks over there. Okay? You're more likely to vote for a taller and more handsome candidate. He, he just won. This is Blasio in New York. He just won. He beat them. Okay? How will they vote? What do you think? I'm not saying those particular people. I'm saying statistically, how do you think they'll vote? For Hillary. Women. The women will vote for Hillary? Women in their own demographics. Um, Okay, so assuming that you that you know that if she, if you know that this one's a hard Republican, she's not voting for Hillary, you know, regardless. But assuming that she's not, she's more likely to vote for Hillary because gender identity, right? Don't know, but African Americans tend to vote overwhelmingly Democratic. We do know that, right? Ninety plus percent most of the time. He's a wild card. We have no idea. They could be all. This could be a Democrat convention for all we know, right? Did O.J. do it? What do you think? O.J. Simpson, remember him? Did he do it? How do you think they'll answer? Women will say yes. <laughs> what do you think he'll say? Yeah. No, statistically that's true. What do you think he'll say? Yes. Statistically that's true. This doesn't sound rational so far. I mean, we didn't even hear the jury evidence yet. Right? Statistically yes, statistically no. What do you think? Okay, hold on. Not yet. This one, uh, this one will say yes, this one will say yes, this one's conflicted. A revealing study attempted to predict which, uh, which black women would believe O.J. Simpson was guilty of killing his wife. African American women who were in an emotionally complicated position, as women, they were likely to identify with his wife, and hence, to be emotionally inclined to take seriously evidence such as DNA samples. On the other hand, as African Americans, they were likely to identify with Simpson, and African Americans overwhelmingly believe that OJ was framed. Right? Wow. Okay? So, how do they resolve this conflict? The answer lies in the relative strength of their identification, and by extension, their feelings. The extent to which African American believed uh, African American women believed Simpson was guilty depended on the extent to which they identified with being black or being female. Okay? If being female was more central to their identity, they were more likely to believe evidence against Simpson. If their African American identity was stronger, they were more likely to find the evidence uncompelling. Okay, does anybody want to make the case that people are perfectly rational? Right? Um, it's a hard, hard case to make. We are irrational. Here, here's some evidence. Remember this? It's a good pack for you. No. Cocaine? No thanks. No, my man, he wants nudes. Oh, no what? If someone offers you drugs, instead of saying something you really don't mean, just say, No. Got some sense of million for you. No. No. No big production number. Just say, No. You'd be surprised how well it works. I, no. The Just Say No campaign. That was during the 80s. Just Say No. How well did it work? It didn't. I mean, it's eminently rational, right? Well, here's some drugs. No. <laughs> All right? What's the problem? How well did it work? It, it was terrible. It was a complete, utter failure. How about this? You're confronted with facts. Another one from the 80s. Is there anyone out there who still isn't clear about what doing drugs does? Okay. Last time. This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Okay, and so millions of addicted people all across America went, I gotta stop doing crack. Right? No. I mean, it's completely rational, but did it have any effect? 
No. Okay. So they're irrational. Even when they're not being malicious, people are prone to errors. This is part of our sinful world. Humans. One day we're coming up with the theory of relativity, the next, not so much. But that's okay. You're covered with great ideas like optional better car replacement from Liberty Mutual Insurance. Total your car and we give you the money to buy one a model year newer. Learn about it at LibertyMutual.com. Liberty Mutual Insurance. Responsibility. What's your policy? Okay. Uh, so even when we're not, you know, just, we're just going to show them that we're not rational. Even just making errors, right? Okay. Anybody know who this is? Adam Smith? Okay. I, I'm even wearing an Adam Smith tie, right? I love the guy. I'm a free marketeer. But he wasn't totally sufficient. Okay? It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from the regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them out of our own necessities, but of their advantages. What he's saying is, because they're self-interested, they'll do stuff like sell you something when they can profit from it. <coughs> I'm a free marketeer, I believe that, that's wonderful, but it's not sufficient in and of itself to make the world go around. Okay? Because people have different reasons for doing things. And sometimes we talk about it like, um, you know, well, oh, but they do the most rational thing for them. Well, okay, so smoking crack is the most rational thing that you can think of. Okay, something's wrong with that theory, but, but it, it's not that they're irrational like they're just not thinking, but there's more to it than just the neocortex. You know that over layer in your head, the, the topmost layer, the neocortex, okay? We don't always stay there. Sometimes we're in our amygdala, way in the center of the brain, okay? And when you're in your amygdala, that's the emotional part. That's what, when people are playing on your emotions, leaders are trying to drum up something or really rile you up, or you're afraid of something, that's the amygdala, okay? So you have to factor in both pieces. It's, um, to just assume that you, could, you should just talk to the neocortex is not dealing with them as total humans as they are. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, so that brings us to chapter one. What is organizational behavior? Organizational behavior um, is comprised of a number of contributing disciplines, including psychology, which we talked about at some length, sociology, anthropology, and social psychology. Uh, and, and if you put all of these things together, you get a lot of different ways of looking at how organizations actually function and why they're dysfunctional many times. Okay? Management functions consist of things like planning, leading, organizing, and controlling. This is common. This is what you'll find in any you know, normal management textbook. This is an interesting chart. Here's how managers allocate their time. Average managers spend kind of an, you know, equal amounts of time doing different things. Uh, traditional management kind of things, communicating, human resource management, and networking. Successful managers um, as opposed to effective managers, successful managers, those who are getting bumped up the, the chain, spend extra time uh, networking. Effective managers, um, uh, those who are actually really good at their job and doing what they're supposed to be doing, spend extra time communicating, right? So if you want to get promoted faster, <laughs> extra time on networking is uh, apparently the way to go. If you want to actually do your job well, extra time communicating is the way to go. Now, some time ago, uh, I gave a little presentation at a conference um, and it was entitled, If You Want Leaders, Stop Teaching Students to Be Managers. Okay? And here's how this works. And please, if you have something to add, feel free to add. To <coughs> so we have that basic managerial chart we just talked about. Management is planning, leading, organizing, and controlling. Now, planning is things like creating a plan, defining goals, uh, problem solving, top to bottom, management plans, workers work. Right? Everybody agree? Anybody want to add something to it? That sounds right? Okay. Leading is directing, coordinating, it's motivating workers to carry out plans, it's harnessing followers, it's positional. You have this office, so you're the leader. Okay? Uh, and it also is by personal example. Organizing is determining what's to be done and who's to do it. Organizational charts, it's a mechanistic model. It's here's your job description, you do your job, you do your job, you do your job, and we'll be just fine. And it's uh, you know the chain of command. I'm the manager. You're the assistant manager, and you're just a worker, and you're just a worker, and you're just a worker. It's a work worker, okay? 
And then controlling is evaluating, monitoring activities, ensuring compliance, enforcing <coughs> rules, supervising, rewarding, and punishing. Tell me if there's anything in this job that you think that I'm saying here that is squirrely, not, not accurate. Everything sounds right so far? Yes? Okay. So here's how it works. Top manager's plan. And then they motivate their workers to carry out their plan. And then they organize for efficiency. And then they control to be sure that their plan is uh, completed correctly. Right? Okay. That's what's taught in most textbooks. Problem is it doesn't work. Right? It leads to all these maladies, inefficiency, miscommunication, demoralization, distrust, lack of ownership, lower productivity, absenteeism, higher turnover, workplace deviance. And there's a, a list of other things too. These are just some of the heavy hitters. Why? What's going on? Isn't that what the textbook told us to do? Not what? It's just on paper. I mean. It's just on paper. So it really doesn't, it shouldn't work that way? It doesn't appeal to the, what is the middle part of your brain? The part? emotional part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't appeal to you as a human. <coughs> you are made in the image of God. You have hopes and dreams and aspirations. And what are they totally uh, ignoring? You. They just want a pair of hands. Go do the work. I'm, I'm the head. You're the hands. Go work. Okay? So when I was asking myself what's going on, I decided... Well, let's look at uh, the literature, what it says about leadership. So what's the, li the uh, academic literature say about leadership? Well, it is motivation and it is influence, but it's more than that. It's vision, it's relationship, change, emotional connection, leading by example, and a number of other things. Motivation uh, and leadership is more about motivating and inspiring than controlling, right? Think about a good leader that you follow, okay? Get that person in your head. Everybody got somebody? Still looking at you. Uh, I haven't had a good leader. <laughs> no? Okay? So when you have this good leader in your head, this should ring true. Okay? Influence. Influence is the increment above and beyond mechanical compliance. Right? I can tell my kids, go to your room. Right? But I haven't really won anything. All I got is a couple minutes of quiet. Right? I haven't really won them over. And your boss does the same equivalent to you or can do the same equivalent to you. They can bully. Okay? Leadership, the true measure of leadership is influence. It's not about force, it's about persuasion. Vision is a shared vision, a sense making, and setting direction, a clear purpose, planning, it's a compelling future. Relationship, leadership is better defined as a process or relationship. Relationship is a core ingredient of leadership. Emotional connection, leadership is an emotional connection. Where management is rational, leadership is emotional. Mentors, for example, make emotional connections with their protégés. Change. The purpose of leadership is change. Management is about coping with complexity. Leadership is about coping with change. Leading by example. Leadership is the process of persuasion. The first step is modeling the way. Those that set performance high for themselves can earn credibility. Leadership, uh, it results from your example of empowering others to lead. Servant leadership is like uh, Jesus Christ you know, washing the, the feet of the disciples. Other rela uh, factors related to leadership include things like alignment and credibility and duplication, distributed leadership, empowerment, developing character, emotional intelligence, adaptive change, self-knowledge, authenticity. Okay, so leadership is actually, according to the uh, Center for Creative Leadership, three elements, direction, alignment, and commitment. <coughs> That's different than planning, leading, organizing, and controlling, right? Direction, alignment, and commitment. So let's look at this in the managerial chart, because there's another way of looking at this. Here are those functions again. And then, is there more to leadership than motivating and influencing, directing, and uh, we think, yes, there is, right? That's a very different list. Okay, now, let's take this. How would a robust view of leadership change the way we lead? I mean, if we could apply that to the other areas, if we could apply leadership to all managerial processes, what would that look like? How would that transform planning and organizing and controlling? It would even transform leading. I mean, if you allowed yourself to do more than motivating. Go do my plan. How would it change it? Well, uh, you would have some of these functions, creating a plan, defining goals, and establishing strategy, uh, and problem solving, but not so much top to bottom, right? Wouldn't top to bottom kind of go away and be altered? Yes, no? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it would change significantly. So let's put this to the side. 
And let's look at, you know, I, I talked about this earlier, Henry Ford said, why is it that I always get a whole person with what I really want is a pair of hands? You ever felt like a pair of hands at work? Mm -hmm. Like that's all that they want you to do? We don't, I don't want you to think, okay? I already got it, right? I'm a genius, you don't know this stuff. I've been doing this for 20 years, right? You ever been condescended to like that? It's not fun. And your amygdala is going nuts, okay? <laughs> so. Leadership would include emphasizing vision, establishing purpose, a compelling future, sense-making, setting direction, empowering others, right? bringing out the best that you could with them, duplicating leadership, okay? the kind of ideas you find in things like Covey's principle-centered leadership. Right? Uh, so their implications here are things like it's an empowering process, it's involving other people from the start. It's consulting with a team. It's using their ideas. In fact, one of my organizational behavior students, uh, two, two classes ago, said, you know, if you're really doing this right, and this is where I've got the uh, using their ideas. Well, I'm using his idea. Um, he said, your people are going to come to you and bring you ideas, right? What if, what if the environment is such that I care about the ideas that are in your brain? Guess what? You start bringing ideas forward. What if they're just going to discount it? What do you do? I'm going to sit on my hands. You, okay, you do want to do it that way? That's why. Right? Okay. Never tell people how to do things, tell them what to do, and they will surprise you with their ingenuity. So, how about, um, so we're going to create a plan, we're going to define goals, we're going to establish strategy, problem solve, and those go into the implications, of, but we're going to do it in a different way now. We're going to do it in an empowering way, involving people from the start. How about leading? It's more than directing and motivating, but let's get rid of this harnessing followers. People are not animals. Right? We're going to harness our people's potential. How arrogant does it sound? Right? It's positional by office. You know, we're going to stop leaning on our office and actually, you know, go for an aristocracy of ideas. Yes, I have the final say because I'm the boss, but if I'm smart, I'm not going to wield that. Okay? <coughs> it's involving influencing and persuading, not coercing. It's motivating. It's personal relationship. It's an emotional connection, mentoring and modeling, servant leadership, authenticity and credibility. It's a very different thing, right? It's more than just, here's my plan, woohoo, we're going to do it, woohoo, right? Take my plan that you've never seen before, run with it. What? We're going to do it very differently. And the implications is it's going to go beyond motivation. It's knowing yourself and knowing your people, right? I mean, really knowing your people, how they fit, okay? Emphasizing trust. Restraining yourself. Now this is important, restraining yourself. How many bosses feel that they, they ought to restrain themselves around their employees? You, they, they do know that they need to restrain themselves around their boss, right? I'm not gonna tell the VP off, right? But they don't feel any problem with you know cursing you out, right? Why? They got it backwards. The, if they wanna be successful, it's not like they should curse the boss out either, but if they want to be successful, if I curse you out, you're not coming to me with other good ideas later on, right? Team building, growing leaders. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, an institution is a lengthened shadow of one man. Well, yeah, kind of, but you know what you really want to do is not just lengthen his shadow, you want to grow leaders. I mean, all the way through the organization. Let's talk about organizing, determining what's to be done and how to do it, organizational charts, mechanistic model. How many of you like to be a cog in a machine? Anybody feel good about being a cog? I'm replaceable completely. My life has no value. Show of hands. Okay. Oh, look where I am in my chart. Yay. So what? Um, so here, let's get rid of the mechanistic model and talk about the chain of command. Let's put that aside. Instead of looking at the organizational chart, let's look at alignment. Okay. So let's say you love writing. Which clearly you do. You love writing, okay? And you love the numbers. I mean, you can't get enough of the numbers. I. It's, okay. So let, let's say let's flip that. What if what if I have two employees that do exactly the same thing, and their organizational chart description says that they do half of their thing is do writing reports and half of their thing is analysis that's mathematical. Why on earth? Do we say, well, you know, I expect that report and I expect that analysis. I expect that report and that. Why not say, you know, she's really a good writer and he's really good with numbers. Let's 
let her do what she's good at, let him do what he's... But, but the organizational chart says, <gasps> somebody wrote that. Somebody can scratch it out and write something else in crayon. <laughs> they can. It's, it's okay. That's what we mean when we talk about alignment instead of relying on the organizational chart. It's just a different way of looking at it. Okay? Expecting change. Change is a part and process. Um, I, I was going to reference these books, but I, I decided for time's sake I'm just going to keep going. Uh, beyond efficiency, you're removing obstacles. That's your, your goal when you're leading, is to remove obstacles so your people can work. You're maximizing strength, you're investing in people, you're treating each of your people differently. Uh, i got to go back to the book. Enjoy at work. Um, Dennis Bob talks about his, his children and how he deals with each of his children differently. Not the same. Not everybody's exactly equal. No. My children are the same way. My children are differently. I was just talking to... Um, Scott Pearson, our chair, I was talking about my kids' personalities where if I want my oldest to do something, I kind of provoke her a little bit. Oh, you can't get this stuff. Yes, I can. Right? If I do that to the next one, you really think I can't do it? Right? I, I don't do that to the next one. What I do with that one is go, come on, buddy, you can do it. Right? Because I know them, and they're different people, and they're motivated different ways. Same thing at work. I mean, why would why would that logic not hold up there? But no, 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 we gotta treat everybody exactly equally. Why? Treat them differently because they're different. Okay. A uh, hundred people. I can't get into that. Well, okay. So he calls. He says, talk about your how your uh, your employees are associates. Okay. Treat them with respect, like they are associates, not that they're employees, but that I mean, they're esteemed. They know what they're talking about. They're the front line. They've been doing this for years. Treat them with that respect. Now, you know the difference between that and when Walmart calls you an associate and then pays your minimum wage, right? There's a difference between the two. I, I like Walmart if I shop there, but I, I wouldn't want to work there, right? I mean, for consumers, great. It's $2,000 a year rates compared to the other store. No, seriously, I mean, that's the statistical difference. It's $2,000 a year raise to shop at Walmart as opposed to get your groceries from another a supermarket, okay? But I wouldn't work there for the world. Okay? Because they don't treat you like an associate. Okay? Now, let's set this aside, these things that you need to do in controlling, evaluating and monitoring and ensuring compliance and enforcing rules and supervising and rewarding punishment. Okay? You kind of need to do that, but you need to do that a lot less if you do all these other things right. Does that make sense? Are we getting that? So let's set this aside, and then let's look at the things that you would actually do. Um, this is uh, Rachel Wagner. Do you know who she is? Okay? Rachel's awesome. Okay, she makes the system run. Okay, the uh, graduate program, she's the administrator of graduate programs. I don't, okay, hug your people. Here's why we put that book in there. They talk about how, you know, you check in with your people. You don't check up on them. You ever have a boss check up on you? Like, hmm, so are we getting something done today? <laughs> hmm? Ah, I see you have your computer open to Facebook instead of, right? Checking up on you is a different thing than checking in, right? So I'll stop in and say, hey, what can I do for you? Why? Because she's an associate. She is more competent at this than I am by a long shot, right? She knows what she's doing. I'm just seeing if I can be of help to her. It's a very different thing than if I'm checking in to see if she's doing her job, right? So controlling. If you're controlled by the vision, if you came to CSU because you, you're into what CSU is all about, you're not really the kind of person that they got to worry about in residence life. You, you know what I'm saying? I, it's just a different thing. Relationship. If you're controlled by a relationship, my, when I was in graduate school, um, I worked in the library.